Good morning. <laughs> um, I think it told me you're all on listen-only mode. Um, Dan is helping us out with the mechanics of the GoTo webinar, so please let us know if you have any issues. Um, I think there's a way to ask questions through the webinar, which we'll go over. Um, but yeah, we'll go over that shortly. Um, I guess that's it. Okay, so thank you all for joining this morning. Um, this is a follow on to the CPD Part 50 training. Um, a lot of you have taken that either last year or um, in the, a few months ago, there was one in DC. As you know, that training really covers a lot of stuff and really gets into the weeds about environmental review. Um, this aim of this training is hopefully to, one, bring it down to earth and to sort of make it, um, make it clear sort of how RAD, within RAD we implement environmental review. Uh, so if you can go to the next slide. Um, this is the administrative ending recorded. Um, we can put the slides up, but I think at least initially we'll just email them to you. Um, along with any follow-up that we have. Um, and then just want to make sure that you ask questions. So this is really helpful if I, um, you know, hear from you all and, and learn a little bit more. So this slide provides instructions on how to ask questions. Um, I'll just give you a minute to look that over because I think it will only be there for a short time. <laughs> Good morning. Hello. Kind of a small group in the room, so come in. Yay! <laughs> I'll just be talking. <laughs> Thanks for joining. Um, we just got started, and we're going over the um, administrative info of the GoTo meeting. Um, and just wanted to quickly say that um, this is supposed to be a follow-up to the CPD Part 50 training, which was a lot of stuff, <laughs> and really just sort of a practical way to implement environmental review. We'll go ahead and get started. We'll go to the next slide. Um, this is the agenda for. Uh, to covering why do we do this, <laughs> some key terms and concepts, and then a quick review of the related laws and authorities. I won't really go into the weeds on these because you had the training and that was beaten into your heads. Um, so I don't want to do that over again. Um, but certainly if you have any questions about specific issues, please let me know. Uh, you raise your hand through the webinar or just ask in person and um, we can talk about that. And then uh, we'll talk, the, really the meat of the presentation is about implementing environmental review for RAD. So talking about the timing and the process, our guidance and the MAP guide and how they relate, and a uh, sneak preview for some upcoming guidance changes, which I hope people will be happy about. <laughs> um, then we'll take a short break, um, and let your brains rest for a minute, and then we'll finish out with some just tips and how to go over some roadblocks, um, and then just close out and check if we have any questions. Um, I'll take questions sort of within each section, but certainly if there's something that you think of later, we can always come back to it and, ask and talk about that. So, next slide. Okay, so getting started on brief review of Environmental Review 101. Um, so, where does this all come from? Why do we do this? <laughs> uh, basically, uh, the National Environmental Policy Act is uh, a law that requires federal agencies to assess the environmental effects of their actions basically says, hey, federal agencies, you do stuff with federal money and we want you to make sure that these won't have um, ill effects. Basically, it, it provides a framework and decision-making process, so it's a way of thinking about uh, these different rules that we have to follow. Um, and basically stipulates how that we're supposed to sort of prepare detailed statements in assessing these impacts. Um, you can get into the weeds in it, but that's the basic overview. That's totally fine. Next slide. Um, so each federal agency develops procedures that supplement sort of the, the federal level regulations. For HUD, we do that through um, Part 50, which is what you know of as what we call Part 50 reviews, but that's basically the requirements when HUD conducts an environmental review. 51 has some of the weird HUD standards that we have, um, 55 is floodplains and wetlands, and then 58 is the local government review, also sort of what we call environmental reviews that come in from uh, responsible entities. And there's also program specific requirements. Um, so uh, OEE does that, um, Office of Environment and Energy, they steward the policy for the department. 
but just so you know sort of where we sit in context with the rest of uh, the federal government on NEPA. Um, so there's also a lot of really interesting statutes to sort of pave the way for environmental regulation. This is the stuff that I personally find really interesting of how we turned a lot of dirty, gross places into less dirty, gross places <laughs> through law and uh, sticks and carrots to make sure these places get cleaned up. Um, for, like combined, they really just uh, show the federal government like starting to regulate um, how we uh, affect the environment and vice versa. The next slide. Just going to briefly go over some of these. Um, really started in the 1970s, where we regulated releases into air. Then we did the OSHA Act, which talked about toxic substances and clean water. Slowly and surely, we're getting <laughs> warm to the idea that air and water should be clean. Um, <laughs> then there is the Toxic Substances Control Act. That was a catch-all for a lot of dirty nasties, such as CFCs, uh, PVCs, and asbestos. Go to the next slide. That's just a picture. I'm trying to put pictures in here to not have walls of text to you all for the whole day. Um, that is beautiful, smog-ridden LA, I think. <laughs> Next slide. <laughs> um, here are some two really sort of important ones. Uh, RCRA, which is in 1976, which gave EPA sort of broad authority over waste generation. is very prescriptive and um, just gave a lot of like very firm um, guidelines. And what really sort of affects us is CERCLA or the Superfund law. Basically provided a system for identifying and cleaning up hazardous substances in air, water, groundwater, and on land. So you may have some uh, deals where they're adjacent to or even on a Superfund site. Um, that just means that <clears throat> the site has been identified as sort of having these substances and they're currently being worked through of, of how who is responsible and what should happen. It doesn't necessarily mean that things can't happen on that site. It's just that there's a lot more attention paid to it. Uh, next slide. That is a gross thing. <laughs> That's probably a super fun site. Um, just a lot of gross materials in uh, the ground. Next slide. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, a lot of these acronyms are amazing. Um, sort of amended CERCLA uh, liability provisions to give sort of the innocent landowner defense for cleanup purposes. And then my favorite acronym, which I claim is winner of best acronym, um, the Small Business Liability Relief and Brownfield Revitalization Act, which is a mouthful, um, basically provided uh, funding for Brownfield's development and addresses sort of the state response program. So here's an example of a brownfield site in Houston where they redeveloped it into a ball field, which I think is a good use of dirty ground because people will barely be on it. Uh, next slide. So what is environmental review? Basically, it's a systematic process of reviewing a project and determining whether it meets all these standards. Um, for HUD, the process is required for all HUD-assisted projects, and not every project is subject to a full environmental review. <clears throat> Um, we'll examine the impact, but the, the level of effort of the examination really varies. But basically, all projects and activities in HUD have to be compliant with NEPA, even down to uh, notices and very paper-based exercises. We don't worry about that here, but that's just, just to give you an indication that really everything we do is subject to environmental review. Next slide. Um, you have to do it before uh, funds are committed to a project. The way we enact that in RECAP is um, we have to complete the environmental review before the RCC is uh, signed. So we document the environmental review in an environmental re review record or your hero's um, input. Basically has a description of all the activities that are part of the project and an evaluation of the uh, effects of the project on the human environment and vice versa. Next slide. Um, so in summary, uh, environmental review is just a, a, a method of assessing impacts. It has to be done before you spend money, and we need to create an environmental review record to document the decision making. So getting into some of the key terms and concepts, um, just wanted to go over these briefly because I know a lot of you have a lot of experience with environmental review, but some of uh, our staff are a little bit newer at this, so just wanted to hopefully <laughs> um, approach both populations. Um, so 
a HUD program falls either under Part 50 or Part 58. That really falls along whether there's sort of an intermediary between HUD and uh, the money. So, for example, for PBRA, HUD is really making a direct uh, contract with uh, an owner, so it's a Part 50 program, whereas Part 58, there, for PBV purposes, there is a sort of public housing authority in between. So that's sort of a way to think about it. Part 58 really came about in the 90s um, <clears throat> in the Clinton administration as a way to sort of delegate some federal authority down to the state and local level. So just a way for local entities to make those decisions. It also probably took a lot of work off of HUD's plate, especially in an area where there weren't a lot of uh, electronic resources available. So it's just a way to get states and local governments to, to do the work. Um, so, oh, if you go back. Uh, for RAD, again, just to review, PBVs are Part 58, PBRA, FHA insured, it's a Part 50, but FHA performs in their own process. Really, what we do is uh, Part 50s that are PBRA, not FHA insured. However, um, and I'll bring this up a few times today, there is a provision in Part 58 called 5811C, which allows HUD to take over a Part 58 review, basically magically turn it into a Part 50 due to timing or capacity issues. Some of you may have elected to do this in cases where a deal needs to close really quickly. Um, I know we ran into this last year with some deals that had historic credits and the historic credit may have been going away. So it was just easier and quicker for us to do a Part 50 um, because there's not a lot of the public notice requirements that take some time. So it's just a way to get things done. Also useful if uh, the local government just elects not to do it. So sometimes these uh, projects may be in places where there isn't a lot of, um, they might be not entitled like communities basically, where there's not a lot of uh, activity around these things and there may not, literally may not be someone to do it. Um, can we go to the next slide? Okay. So a responsible entity is a unit of local government. Um, they're responsible for the Part 50 in the same way that we are responsible for the Part 50. It is not a PHA and it is not the environmental report provider. Um, don't let them tell you otherwise. <laughs> next slide. Uh, so, once the, the um, once the review goes through Part 50 or Part 50, it also gets sort of um, siphoned out into level of review um, once the scope of the project is known. So, there's a list of all really the ways that it can go within HUD environmental reviews, but basically uh, the ones highlighted in red are what we see a lot. Uh, the project can convert to exempt, which is a Part 58 only thing. Um, most of our projects for Part 50 fall into the CEST, which is categorically excluded from NEPA, but it's subject to the related laws and authorities. And then there are um, environmental assessments, which are all the projects that are not categorically excluded. Basically anything with demolition, new construction falls into an environmental assessment. We may have EISs, but that is highly unlikely. Um, you should already be talking to your field environmental clearance officer if you suspect that this is necessary. Um, just to note too, and they brought this up in the training, sort of a, um, a project that is initially designated as CEST can then convert to an EA. You can always sort of roll them up um, if there are sort of mitigating requirements that make it so you should really do the full review. Next slide. Uh, just to go into detail with these a little bit more, um, exempt converts when there is no compliance or mitigation required for all the related laws and authorities. Um, CEST applies when RAD projects um, have work above maintenance but below the level of substantial rehab. Density is, um, when density is not increased by 20%, land use isn't changed, and then the cost of rehab is less than 75% of the total estimated cost after replacement. There is no defined way that HUD calculates what that means. That cost metric, I would say do your best. Most of your projects will fall into categorical exclusion. Um, we're thinking about maybe drawing some bright lines within um, RECAP to, for RAD just to make clear what types of activities fall into where. Um, still working on that, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. And then environmental assessments are really just real major things, new construction demolition, as discussed. Next slide. Here's a nice graphic that I stole from the HUD exchange, which um, illustrates sort of what requirements you have to be met. We live in the middle and assessed in the EA. 50.4 is the list of related laws and authorities like airport hazards, uh, contamination, uh, wetlands, things like that. In addition to those related laws and authorities, there's also the uh, EA factors and the NEPA analysis. EA factors are a lot of things to do with zoning and capacity of the 
local community to for schools and hospitals and things like that. Um, we can talk about that a little bit later. Um, next slide. So another key idea is the project description. It's really the main source of information within the environmental review record about the project. So this is if sort of everything is destroyed, but somehow this environmental review survives in HEROES, like this is really the record of like what happened and what we assess. So it's important that you document all the activities, like what is actually happening, and include reference to all sources of federal funding. That's especially important in case the review is being used for more than one program. But it's just easier to just be clear and make sure that there are no um, gaps left so that uh, the, the review can sort of encompass all reasonably foreseeable activities. So in summary, key terms and concepts, the responsible entity will conduct a Part 58 review. There are other procedural steps to complete the review, um, which are located in the RAD guidance and should be known by PH field office staff, but if not, um, we have sort of a list of what is supposed to happen. Um, don't worry about perfecties with FHA insurance. Perfecties without are the focus of this training, but we'll talk a little bit on the sides about some 58 issues. And then just making sure your project description describes all activities. I'll stop now if there's any questions initially. Nope. You all are geniuses and understand. <laughs> Can you, just, uh, yeah. can you go back to the slide just before I have a, a question yeah, about sure. um, this is important in uh, cases being used for more than one program. Yep. Are you talking about more than one HUD program or yep. more than one? So maybe for an example, CPD or some other, mm -hmm. they would do another review of the same environmental report? Yeah, so what we're trying to avoid is doing exactly that. <laughs> okay. Yeah, which okay. is... It takes some effort on our part, um, but it's really a way to think about, you know, if your transaction really has to close quickly and they have to do a 50 and a 58, often the 50 is faster. Um, if you're invoking 5811 to just do one review for everything, um, it's often quicker um, and we do it well. Um, but it just involves communicating with uh, CPD. I'll talk a little bit about that later, um, but basically, um, it is possible. Um, the common ones are home, uh, CDVG, and then we are. We can also do it uh, for PIH PBVs because technically they're also supposed to have a review for PIH PBVs. Um, we haven't been as good at that one, um, and we'll talk a little bit later about some upcoming guidance to sort of make that a little bit easier because we commonly see uh, PBVs, P PIH PBVs with uh, RAD PBRA. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, it's, uh, yeah. Yeah. So the idea is like HUD is trying to stop being dumb and just do things once. Yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah. But it does take some effort. It is a little bit more manual. But um, it's happening. It's happening yeah. where it's one review is being reviewed by multiple yes. offices within the same yeah. agency. Yeah. That's and that's really sort of dumb. that sort of happens already, sort of automatically in cases where there's FHA insurance and PBRA. It's just doing one part 50, but they're sort of the same thing anyway, so it's a little bit different, but yeah, trying to get communication. Um, PHAs, um, for projects they may be doing an environmental review for tax credit purposes, that's sort of separate and often happens on its own just because the timing is a bit different. And I'll talk a little bit later about the timing of reviews, especially for part 50. They are extremely late. Um, Whereas for Part 50, they may be able to coordinate that a little bit easier, but that's on them and the responsible entity. So that's for them to really figure out. <laughs> so. Okay. We'll go on to our next. Uh, just, okay. So, for labor laws and authorities, yes. Um, <laughs> these are really the, the meat of what environmental review is. There's all these little wonky things that we have to speak to. Um, they're sourced from really one or more regulations. Some are born out of legislation itself. So air quality came from the Clean Air Act and its subsequent implementing regulations. Remember that Clean Air Act when um, the federal government finally re realized we needed clean air to breathe in the 70s, um, <laughs> they implemented um, this way, this mechanism of sort of regulating along that Clean Air Act. Um, some are born out of executive orders, so the wetlands protection um, is actually from an executive order, 
um, and its subsequent implementing regulations. And some are implemented sort of by HUD regulation only. So there are certain things that only HUD cares about, which are weird. Um, explosive and flammable facilities is one, which I think is actually important <laughs> to not have a uh, flammable facility next to places where people live. It's kind of scary to think about why they needed to have that, um, and it wasn't common sense, but I guess there needed to be a sort of a tooth to, to get some of these products in trouble um, and regulate them in some way. So we can go to the next slide. So again, related laws and authorities are the meat of rad environmental review, um, even within, but even within sort of the categorical exclusion, categorically excluded subject to level of review, which is where most of our deals live, there is wide variance in how much sort of compliance or level of effort is required for each of them, depending on the scope of the project and where it is cited. So depending on activity and location, these are really the key ways that they, they uh, the related laws and authorities vary. So farmlands protection is likely always in compliance because we're likely doing these um, projects in urban infill settings or even suburban infill settings, basically areas that are already developed and we are not converting land uses. Um, pretty much always probably going to be fine. Um, above ground storage tanks are not assessed if rehab of existing buildings does not increase densities, for example. So that's an example of an activity base. Compliance variation, whereas farmland is more location based. So I'm going to quickly go through this list, and I'm going to provide this in just a sheet. I'll provide the slides later, but I'm also hoping to make just one sheet with the links on the right. Um, we'll talk a little bit later about what the mapper means and when you would use it and if you choose to use it, but just wanted to quickly go over some of these. Um, and talk about their sort of base compliance type. By base compliance type, I mean What's the first easiest thing that you can get to to clear this thing out of the way and say, okay, they satisfy this requirement. There's nothing that we need to do. Um, again, that's either location-based or activity-based. I think it's a good framework of thinking about what you're trying to seek for each uh, related law and authority. Heroes does a great job of sort of guiding this, but um, I think this just gives an even more reduced framework of thinking about this. So airport hazards is location-based. Um, you can find um, information on NEPA Assist. Uh, for those of you who don't know, NEPA Assist is basically the holy grail of information for environmental review if you ever need to source information. Again, we'll talk about that later, what that means, and if, if you want to sort of source that information. Uh, coastal Barrier Resources, again, location-based within one of those units. Flood Insurance, location-based. Air quality, it really depends on the activity. Um, if there's new construction of five room or dwelling units, then you have to start complying with that. Uh, coastal zone management, um, it's location based within a coastal zone that is within a state with coastal zones. So some states are landlocked and don't have coastal zones. Um, so they already are in compliance by nature of literally being in that state, but then some are in parts of the state that are not in a coastal zone. Contamination is uh, it's project specific and just something that will need to be assessed everywhere. Next slide. Endangered species, activity based, where if there's anything above interior renovations to existing buildings and then minor exterior repairs, and you start assessing endangered species. So, a lot of our projects, I think, fall into this where we're replacing cabinets and toilets and stuff like that, and we're not doing anything outside, then you're already in compliance with endangered species. Um, explosive and flammable hazards, um, it really deals with anything that puts more people in a place to so development or increasing densities, or if it, the project has a hazardous facility, which I hope is not really the case for any of our projects. Farmlands, we talked about that. That's the easiest one in the world. Um, next slide. Floodplain, again, dealing with flood maps and with it, within a special flood hazard area. Historic preservation, currently, this is the one that's really onerous and um, tricky. Um, currently, we're any sort of physical impact and generally ground disturbance, you would have to consult with the SHPO and or the tribal historic preservation officer. Um, we'll talk a little bit later about some efforts to try and make that less awful. <laughs> um, noise, again, within these noise generating things, location based, uh, I've never found a definition of major roadway, so certainly discretion on the part of the provider and or yourself um, would be helpful. 
Um, <clears throat> sole source aquifers, literally, if it sits on top of a sole source aquifer location base, again, another NEPA assist map that is easy to find. Next slide. Wetlands, um, if it's new construction, again, anything sort of major. Um, Wild and scenic rivers is also fairly easy to satisfy. Um, proximity is a quarter mile from each bank. NEPA assist also has good information about that. Um, housing requirements are defined in the map guide. They're project specific. And environmental justice is, um, again, just talk, something that HUD really has to assess. So there's no real um, independent of activity and location. It's something that HUD has to consider. Um, so, quick summary of the related laws and authorities. Make sure your maps have your sites clearly marked, whether the, the provider gives them to you or you have to go source them yourself because you choose to do so. Um, PHA or environmental consultant should provide a full environmental report that speaks to all related laws and authorities. I know we all get a lot of phase ones that just have the phase one and nothing else. That is technically not a full environmental report. They are supposed to speak to all these related laws and authorities, even if they say, well, we're, we're only doing rehab. We don't have to, to speak to this. Well, they do have to speak to it, but the answer may be that they don't have to do anything. They just have to show that they don't have to do anything. Um, so it's possible to sort of quickly source information, but there's sort of no defined standard policy within RECAP on how to handle. Certainly, you can send something back if it doesn't have everything. Um, I know personally I choose not to have that argument sometimes because <laughs> I'm arguing with them on some other issues. Um, but again, just just to be clear, a full environmental report is not just a phase one ESA. So I'll stop question. for questions. Yep. <laughs> so we didn't define, or recap didn't define that environmental report includes a phase one ESA and all related documents from the map guide? It's supposed it's supposed to okay. always do that. That's that's the requirement. It's just that we haven't really as management hasn't told TMs what to do when you don't have all of that. Okay. You are within your rights to send it back. Okay. You can certainly say this isn't complete um, because it doesn't follow the requirements. However Sometimes, like I said, sometimes it's easier to just go get the stuff yourself, <laughs> but that's up to you. Um, it would be good to have some clearer guidance on when we really should be sending these back, um, but I think we'll try to work toward that. Um, do you have a question? You answered it. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is what tricky. What do you do when you decide not to this send it back? This is tricky. Saying, do it yourself. I mean, this legally, they're supposed to give you all the stuff. Um, it's, it depends. Um, I know there are some of us who just tend to just go get it. Um, I, I think the time it would take me to type an email and explain to them is longer than me going to get them out. But everyone has their own tolerance. <laughs> so certainly um, it's your decision. So um, I want to check to see if there's any questions from anyone on the phone. It looks like no. OK, great. So we'll move on. We are buzzing along. Um, I spent a lot of time just in case we have questions, so you may get to use your time back. So we'll see. <laughs> um, OK. So getting into really how we do this within RECAP. So um, the idea is that the PHA submits um, an environmental report, again, that full assessment of all those things to HUD or the responsible entity, Part 50, Part 58, to assist in the environmental review process for RAD. So they're giving us the materials to make the determination. They can provide a determination in some cases. In some cases, it's really objectively clear. Here's a FEMA map where our site is marked and it is not in a special flood hazard area. You can certainly always go and check to make sure it's the most current map. Um, but in many cases, there's just a clear sort of yes or no as to whether a project is in compliance. Um, some things it's a little more uh, loose and sort of up for discussion. I think noise is one of the like least backbone regulation <laughs> areas that we have. Um, it's a lot of strongly recommends on the part of HUD. So I think where those cases where there aren't requirements, just read into the regulations and, and make your own determination because HUD hasn't provided one for you. Um, so just something to think about. 
Um, again, just saying that the, the whole environmental report should be the phase one ESA along with the other materials, and then also information to speak to the environmental assessment factors. Um, those are really hard to speak to without input from the uh, PHA and consultants. Um, and just a note about this, a lot of the consultants, the providers, are firms that do contamination. So these are, you know, entities that are really assessing the dirty nasties in the ground. Um, and they aren't necessarily full-scale uh, environmental review providers. Um, I think, you know, two things will help with this. One is that um, providers can now enter information directly into HEROES. Um, which we'll talk about a little bit later, which some of you may have already had one or two. Um, that'll sort of allow them to see like what's required. Um, it's easy to sort of ignore a checklist if you don't, if you just choose not to do it or send it in. Whereas Heroes really forces you to, to think about it and, and speak to all these related laws and authorities. So I think that will be helpful. And two, PHAs will also have access to uh, Heroes. So even if they have providers who may only speak to contamination or, or sort of, or they only really pay them to do that part, PHAs will certainly be able to complete the review. Um, so I think that will help in terms of being a clearer line of like, you have to do this. Like This is your requirement. Um, and a quick note about that. So they'll provide them, it's in the same way they'll provide the materials, but HUD will still be making the determinations of, okay, this is in compliance or this isn't, it requires mitigation or not. Um, so the PHAs really need to ensure that the materials are prepared timely in conjunction with the transaction time frame requirements. Um, next slide. So, talked a little bit about this, Part 50 and 58 differ in the timing of submission. Um, 58, um, it's up to the responsible entity's requirements, so it's all on them. If they choose to do the environmental review super early, that's their deal. Um, but we really need to see the signed uh, 7516, which is the issued by the PIH field office, which is the authority to grant authority to grant use of funds. It's an awful acronym that I will not say. <laughs> and then, or a finding of exempt activity. I personally see a lot of the finding of exempt activities. Uh, it's just a, a checklist, um, a HUD checklist completed by the responsible entity and signed by them, saying that they are not required to speak to any of these. Um, a note about that on the side, um, we are not really supposed to look behind the Part 58. So even though we suspect that maybe they didn't fully assess all of these things, it's the, the onus and the liability sort of is still with the 58 uh, responsible entity. So all we're looking for is one of these two things. Um, Why would you have a suspicion if they did a full review? Or if they so sometimes things come up later. Um, that we find out for whatever reason. Um, a big a big thing, and I'll talk about this later, is like flood plain, where it's literally in a flood plain and the provider signs the exempt letter. So then if one of the easiest things to satisfy is wrong, um, you begin to suspect that all of it is wrong. <laughs> so and we've also seen some Part 58s get submitted that aren't complete. So they didn't even make a recommendation. Um, they didn't fill out the checklist fully. They still had things to follow up on, um, so it was just prematurely submitted. Um, so it's just, I think, doing a real cursory review just to make sure it looks good. But again, like all you are required to do is just see that it's signed um, and make sure that it, I think at most just sort of making sure that it's timely and encompasses activities that are being undertaken as part of the rod conversion. So sometimes we'll get a six-year-old 58 for their continuing repair activities, and that wouldn't apply. That's different than saying, oh, you didn't properly assess noise. Um, literally seeing if it applies is, is one issue. So this is another tricky area that there's not a lot of there is clear guidance, but it's just a little bit of heartburn. So again, if you ever have questions, talk to your branch chief, or I'm always available as well um, to chat through some of these issues. Can go to the next slide. Um, so for 50s, um, the environmental report is submitted as part of the financing plan, 
and then the review is initiated by whoever's responsible, whether the FHA or us as TM. Um, completion is after everyone signs it and the record is archived, so there's no Form 7015-16, really the heroes entering and the branch chief signing off and other people if, if there are other programs um, and then archiving it. That's completion. Um, and then again, the FICO is certified in cases of um, environmental assessment at over 200 units. So that differs, I think, a little bit from when we first, uh, when I first came on, it was just the 200 units, but now I think it's, e it's EAN 200 units. So a little more relief on that side of things. Um, next slide. So they shouldn't be doing anything without an environmental review. I know this is another tricky area, but technically um, critical repairs may need to fall under the scope of a previously completed 58, which it probably does, to be honest. Um, PHA should work with the PIH field office to ensure compliance. You should, that's not, you should just work to make sure that there isn't sort of anything missing between uh, the environmental reviews. There's no gaps. Um, again, if you have any questions, let me know, but this is another weird one where they can get in trouble if there is work done that doesn't have an environmental review, but it's not necessarily that every single PHA that does this will get in trouble. <laughs> so it's really on the onus of the PIH field office in these cases, but certainly communication between the two is encouraged. Is that mainly a yeah, I, I, well, I know mostly red ones, so yeah, we we have some things which are like immediate like repairs that need to be done that that, that came in through the RPCA and then now I think in the eTool it will come through. I haven't done an eTool yet because I've been on detail, so, um, but yeah, like little things that that should, that if like they had a React inspection or something, they would have caught similar things and they would have had to do it. So it's sort of, it should be normal course of business for the public health and program. So. so literally every action that they take is supposed to have an environmental review. Okay, because I, I, I'm asking because read, read to some properties that have critical repairs as well. And, yeah. And you're saying that critical repairs should not be done until the environmental review has been completed? The, the, the repairs itself are supposed to have a review, um, but for read to, they're already multifamily. They're already multifamily. So that sort of falls some under the. Are, some are going uh, to TBV, which, uh, which means they, they may currently, um, they may not. Okay. And they, they may not currently be in, uh, in multifamily. In, if it's my rehab. Got it. Okay. It's my rehab. Yeah. They're under PIH, though, right? That's a 58 program. So they're supposed to be. Doing that. So that's, that rule applies. Okay. But what I'd say okay. is that's on the entity to know that they have to meet these requirements, and okay. that's the requirements of the programs that are coming from. Yeah. So I'd say don't necessarily worry about this too much, but certainly if when there's more attention paid to a review, there's more chance that these things will come out. So say you're sending this to the field environmental clearance officer because of its size or the EA, there may be questions around the critical repairs. So for me, if I see that there's critical repairs, I just tend to throw in those activities in the description. description. Okay. Um, it may have already occurred. Um, it's not supposed to. <laughs> but again, that's we're not doing anything wrong. The entity should, should be aware of those requirements, but just a thing to look out for in case it comes up, um, because that can be into a little bit of a bad place for them. <laughs> um, oh, we can go back. Um, so any mitigation should be reflected in special conditions of closing. Some of those things you can, um, you should really be solving. It depends on the mitigation and depends on what the plan is. Um, if there's anything really meaty, you may be already involving the FICO um, or other uh, environmental um, officers. Uh, but most things we see are asbestos uh, O&M plans, lead O&M plans, 
they probably should have them already and they may already have them, they just didn't provide it as part of the review. Um, just making sure that those are reflected and we should be following up on those after. So, next slide. Um, so again, summary, um, 58s are really done before financing plan submission um, and they should be done before and then 50s are done upon financing plan submission. Um, one thing I want to call out um, now and I will bring it up a few times is that you should really look at the SHPO and TIPO consultation as the first action um, so that those letters can be sent and the clock started. Um, I, the magical um, Cinderella time frame for these is 30 days. So basically, if you send out the letter on this day, 30 days later, um, if they haven't responded, you can proceed with the project. Um, that if they find any sort of uh, tribal artifacts, everything stops no matter what. Um, that is the only other thing. But that I've literally never seen or heard that, but it's certainly not impossible. Um, but especially for the SHPO, there's um, the clock expires. Um, so that's that. So um, now I'm going to talk about the environmental review guidance and the map guide, which I put little screenshots of both of them. Both were revised in 2016. Um, by map guide, I mean chapter nine of the map guide, which really goes over the processes. And then this is the one on the left is our um, quick reference guide, which talks a little bit more about our programmatic requirements for um, RAD. I have a question. Yeah. That's why I came in. Yep. I, could, I didn't know how to ask it because yep. I think I had to call in. But I need more clarification on the remediation plan for um, new construction that need to be added as a special condition. So what if it's a remediation that calls for um, the digging of soil after um, construction starts, uh -huh. pulling up an underground storage tank to see if there's um, soil, um, what do you call it? Contamination. Contamination. Um, how do you make that a condition, a special condition, when it's actually done after construction starts? Yeah, so that's a really tricky one, and I know I've been dealing with one uh, with Leanne on a, on a similar issue because it's a chicken or the egg Exactly. Problem. <laughs> um, in those cases, I would say one just engage with the, the FICO to really give a clear time frame of what is required. There's some state requirements um, which regulate uh, underground storage tanks, which may be more onerous than federal mm -hmm. stuff. So we don't defer to the state, but because all of these and parties have to sort of accomplish everything in this one bucket, it, it makes sense to, to talk to the FICO because one, they'll know the state requirements and two, like what, what the process should be. But um, yeah, it's tricky because sometimes you're, uh, we had one where the tank came out, um, but the review was supposed to be completed. So you can still complete the review and condition it on the mitigation. So basically saying, we know that this stuff is here and we're going to test it. Mm -hmm. And, and that, that was the, the, the recommendation, yeah. that it be tested once the tank was removed yeah. and it could get that soil that was that um, under there. But in terms of closing, though, it, when you put a special condition out there, who's monitoring it once it closes and it's in that, you know, in between? Who, who, is that my job or is that? And this is a PBRA, and so who's, is that, is that the field office? Who, who is that? <laughs> that's tricky, and it depends on what's happening. And I know that's not a great answer, and that's a lot of the answers a lot of times in the environmental review. So basically, it depends on what's happening. So um, for example, say they have to dig up the, the tank, and they're going to do it either way. You, right. you would, I would say roughly you would complete the review condition saying, we know that they're going to do this tank, and they have to test for contamination. Right. Um, say they do that after. Um, the review is the environmental review is complete, so they're allowed to do that work, and they find there's no contamination. Right. So certainly, you've already sort of cleared the action itself of removing the tank, and they've completed the mitigation of doing the testing. So certainly, during closing, that may happen. Right. So that may be something where they tell you as the TM, or they tell the closing coordinator, but in some way that that's cleared. Right. I I am unfamiliar with 
once it closes and who's following up right. yeah. personally. That, that was right. my question as a follow-up. Yeah. On the mitigation screen, it says that you have to not only have the mitigation plan, but provide information about who mm -hmm. will be monitoring, yeah, who right. will oversee this. And we don't have any clear guidance right. on. We do not. Um, <laughs> I usually put any of that kind of stuff as not a special condition, right. but as like an additional provision to the yeah. RCC. Because once yeah. you put it as a special condition, then the closing unit is going to say, what do we do can't with close it? it? Yeah, yeah. We uh -huh. can't carry right. it. Yeah. So it's not really a special condition. Yeah. It's just a, you know, here's what's mm -hmm. going on. Here's, you know, what's going to happen. But it's not a condition. Yeah. 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 So. Basically, the idea is that you, if they really need to have it clear. Like the, the review has to be completed mm -hmm. because they can't do the work until the review is completed. So, so I, I get you. So they yeah. get to a point where they can remove the tank, mm -hmm. do the testing, and once it's clear, then they can continue with the demolition and new construction. Is that yeah. what you're Yeah, that's, that's the way we would okay. aim to write it. Again, involving the SECO is a blessing because yeah, right. they're the ones who are just A, A, know the state requirements, and then B, just. I've seen like dozens to hundreds but, of these. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. And then my other two cents was on the part 50, mm -hmm. um, getting the uh, environmental reports or the phase one or whatever you're getting mm -hmm. at financing plan stage mm -hmm. to me is almost too late. Yes. So I, I, me, and me personally, I always ask for bonds well in advance yeah. because even though you don't have the number, the, the, the federal number per se, you can get a rough estimate of how much federal dollars they'll be using. Yep. Yep. But at financing plan stage, because personally me, depending on the kind of level of review, it could take me 30 days. I agree. To do uh, environment. It's a minimum of 30 days. It's a minimal of 30 physical days. Physical impacts. And yeah. I think, you know, yeah, we that's a problem. <laughs> We've been talking about it. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, you know, saying that financing, financing plan stage is almost too late. Yeah. Yeah, I I think um, you know we're working on. I know there's talk of amending even the readiness to financing plan structure. I don't know where that is, but I think within that framework, yeah. I agree that yeah. it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's too yeah, late. You, you, yeah. you know, yeah. yeah. It's too late. So, yeah. <laughs> um, I you know, in cases, so I've I've also elected when I'm the readiness TM to just start yeah. early sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, especially if I know that something came up. Mm -hmm. um, but I know some transactions, you aren't the readiness PM and it just gets assigned. So I, it's, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I'm, I'm working, I say that because I'm working on one now where, where it's actually red and Section 18. So I had started yeah. doing the Part 50 mm -hmm. and then they realized, we realized it was going to be Section 18 too. And, they, and I really wanted to push it on the field office, but they didn't want to do it. So I, you know, I didn't feel a comfort level of doing it for both programs, so yeah. I did involve the um, specialist, mm -hmm. the environmental specialist. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. PIH is demo dispo. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. How do you dispose of public um, housing? Especially when they're in floodways. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> or it's been sitting there, you know, like this building had been sitting there for five yeah. years. Empty. Yeah. So, so it's coming down. <laughs> yeah. So, um, okay. Um, but I agree. That's, you know, a good point, and certainly something that I I think about is, in, especially within the time frames is of processing a financing plan. So, yeah. hence why I say get the ship letters out as soon as possible because those can go early, and um, most likely the ship will elect not to consult. Um, if they do elect to consult, it's going to be a long process anyway. So it's better to just get it out and get it started. Yep. So, um, okay. So jumping back to the slides, um, the two guidance picture things. Um, if we can go to the next slide. So the map guide, chapter nine, and our guidance which was that document uh, picture that you saw before, together form our program-specific requirements. Remember I talked before about uh, where HUD's uh, regulations about environmental review sit, the 5058, 50, 55, all that stuff. This is a, a down a level in the program-specific requirements. 
Um, Map Guide provides a lot of process-related information. In some ways, it, it reads like a, a technical step-by-step -step manual um, and provides really the lion's share of the guidance. Um, but generally, relying on Heroes prompts will get you where you need to be. Um, so Heroes, if you're completing the review in Heroes, you're really sort of um, doing the work of, of what's required. Um, go to the next slide. Um, there are several sort of map-only or map-specific attributes uh, that codify the sort of programmatic roles of the HAL of environmental review. Go to the next slide. And just talk about a few of those here. So those key items are really, uh, really rules around phase one ESAs and contamination. So what makes a credible phase one ESA, it references the ASTM standard that uh, is required. Um, processes for what to do when it results in a rec, um, and then the age of the phase one. So within the map guide, phase ones can't be older than a year. Um, so that's also the HUD, the recap, the RAD standard. <laughs> um, but I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, and that's important for their circle of liability. Um, if you ever get a PHA arguing with you that this phase one is fine, um, tell them no, <laughs> if it's a little bit older as well as maybe remind them that they can be exposing themselves to a lot of liability if there are issues um, with contamination. Is um, the same to Part 58 and um, RE? So they are supposed to just basically assess along the related laws and authorities. So I'm not sure how it, it gets into legalese with contamination, but it basically probably is a phase one. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know that it's explicitly spelled out in the 58 regs of like what they have to do. It may be, mm -hmm. um, but the map guide really just gives you the like, here is how you evidence this. Like this is the thing that we need and it really only does it like very in depth for the contamination piece. Um, also housing requirements. So when and how to test for lead asbestos radon. Um, we don't do radon, which we'll talk about. Um, and then depending on the age of the property and level of work, if you go right to the, the map guide, there's it just reads like a book. Um, if it's before 1978, here's what you do. If it's after 1978, here's what you do. Um, and then really what to do if those items are found. Um, if you, this one's tricky if you have questions because sometimes I think the FICOs aren't as, they may be knowledgeable about it because they're supposed to know the program requirements, but they may not necessarily be as well versed in some of it. So. There are other people that we can talk to if there are any gray areas. Certainly, I know our branch chiefs are becoming more and more <laughs> first in Chapter 9. Um, but this is an area, I think, where you know, it may more, uh, make sense to sort of talk um, with other housing staff on it. Um, there's also a program officer, environmental clearance officer, Sarah Jensen, who may be helpful in cases where there's like no one can come to agreement and there may be um, someone needed to weigh in on it. Next slide. Um, the right guidance points to the map guide for how we do this, but we do deviate in a few ways. I mentioned that radon testing is not required, but strongly recommended. Again, strongly recommended is kind of a fun phrase, which means you don't have to do it. <laughs> um, they can elect to do it, and certainly if it's in the, um, in the report, uh, you can elect to include it, um, but it's not really required. No one, I haven't found out why we decided that, um, but it is in place, so we don't have to do it. Um, so also in lieu of the phase one, which is that particular ASTM standard, they can provide a transaction screen, which is another standard. There are theories that it's a little bit cheaper um, and easier to do, um, but if there are any concerns identified, they have to do phase one ESA anyway. Um, so certainly I think for PHAs, if they're looking for advice, if they, you know, are right next to what used to be a smelting plant <laughs> or dry cleaning or something like that, it may make sense to just jump right to the phase one ESA. Um, for sort of newly built properties, it may make sense to do a transaction screen because they know that they already did this assessment a few years ago and everything was fine. Next slide. Um, so use with other programs. Um, talking about this a bit more. So under HUD regulations, so single projects, with both a Part 50 program and a 58 program would require those two reviews, um, but HUD may determine that we can sort of just do one review for both programs. Um, 
if performing the additional review is not feasible in the time allotted, or if it just doesn't make any sense. Um, the key thing here is that the 50 sort of trumps the 58, so we're always doing the 50. It's not the case that you can take a 58 and use for 50 purposes. Um, again, ensure the review covers the full scope of activities. Um, that includes maybe in the project description talking about this environmental review is also being used for Part 58 purposes for XYZ program. Just really spelling it out. Um, I think a lot of responsible entities got dinged um, in the past few years for not necessarily complying with their requirements. Big surprise. Um, so some of them are a little bit risk adverse on this part, but some of them are just happy to, to not do it. But it really just clear spelling it out, I think it gives everyone a little bit more, gives everyone cover and just gives them the confidence that HUD says this is okay. Um, so when one review is used for both programs, uh, the approving officials for both programs should certify for home and CDBG, that's the CPD director, which is the field office director of that jurisdiction um, for the CPD programs. Um, you should also upload a memo that cites that uh, 5811C is being used. Um, I have one that I've used before. Um, I think maybe we can get to just having a standard template um, where you would just dump in the project description um, and just have it ready to go. Um, so it's not really, uh, there's no standard form currently. Um, next slide. So who found it for um, PIH PBBs? For PIH PBBs, it would be the PIH field office mm -hmm. director. Director. Yeah. Um, so, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, so the Part 50, oh, go back. <laughs> Part 50 can't take a Part 58. Um, works well with CDBG, known early and all parties communicate. Um, not as well functioning on the PH PBB side. Big surprise. <laughs> so if you go to the next slide, um, and I'll talk about a bit about that um, in the future in terms of the PBB interaction. Um, but for now, for this summary, let heroes guide your way, reference um, raw guidance in certain areas, and then utilize 5811C if needed, and upload that memo to heroes. So next slide. Okay, um, we will have some guidance changes upcoming. Um, a lot of these are not yet in place, but um, I wanted to give people some minor good news <laughs> today and be the one to be able to talk about it. Um, but this is to say that a lot of these aren't in place yet. Um, we'll certainly notify you, and your branch chiefs will notify you um, when these are in place. But there are some areas of relief upcoming. So we Yay. go to the next. We're going to do our part 54. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> well, the answer is not. Amanda will be doing the part no. <laughs> um, This guy turned happy because there's some guy that she knew. This is my awful way of just not throwing text at you again. Okay, keep going. Um, again, not most of our process is not implemented, so we'll have more guidance. Um, some of these are a little bit weird processy things to work through. So if we go to the next slide. Tiered reviews. Um, so this really arose out of um, efforts around the uh, supplemental notice for small PHAs, trying to make things a little bit easier for them um, for rod conversion. Um, but it's also the case where we're dealing with some of these issues for all rad conversions. Um, so we decided that tiered reviews would sort of apply in the future to all rad transactions um, if, they, if they fall into this category. So just a brief review of tiering. Uh, tiering is a way to make it more efficient by eliminating repetitive discussions, aka we do the same things over and over again, um, and focus on the actual issues, aka the areas that are actually going to change between uh, projects um, for the level of environmental review. So there's um, a broad level review and a subsequent site-specific review. Um, the broad level review, or what you may hear referred to as tier one, will identify and evaluate the issues that can be fully addressed and resolved. So for example, farmland protection can just be like wiped away and just will be spoken for. Um, and it establishes really the processes and, and how we're really implementing the site-specific review. So it talks to about, here's why HUD's doing this, here's how HUD's going to do this, a lot of stuff 
on that. Let's go to the next slide. Um, so for RAD, we're working on a tiered review for transactions without associated physical activities beyond maintenance. In English, this means at conversion and sort of in a reasonably foreseeable time forward, there is no work above the level of maintenance as defined in the CPD Notice 1602. There is a literal chart at the back of this notice which talks about what activities are maintenance and what activities are rehab and above. Um, we've talked to OAE and they've said literally use this chart as a guide. <laughs> so there are certainly be things that we have that will fall in between the cracks, but I found it to be pretty um, clear um, delineation of what would be maintenance and what is not. Um, so this would be in place for all transactions without FHA insurance conducted under Part 50. So that would encompass our regular PBRA reviews as well as the PBVs um, when 5811C is invoked. So you can use this process when you're just doing any, basically, when you are doing any Part 50 review is an easy way to think about it. Um, next slide. So you have a, a, a conversion that's doing rehab that's more internal unit type of rehab, and it would go through this tiered review. So if the scope of work or the activity does it is such that if it's not in the flood plain, so you don't have to do flood zone, flood plain zone, and flood management, that would be. Yeah. So. Yeah, we'll we'll go over this now, but basically anything if it's anything above maintenance, again that chart will just clearly say that. Um we, we looked into what um how many transactions this would be and it's about the way to, to get to that is transactions which there were zero dollars in construction costs mm -hmm. and there was about twenty seven percent of transactions. So a small amount, but not necessarily um you know, it is something. <laughs> this is really going to target projects that aren't doing any work. Yeah, it's just yeah. like transfer of assistance mm -hmm. or yeah. no work. Converting a name only. Mm -hmm. But exactly. in, this is, yes. Yeah. <laughs> We're getting there. We're clawing it. <laughs> We're clawing it. You know it. <laughs> <laughs> but I also wonder. <laughs> I'm very curious. Yeah. <laughs> we have some, uh, Rad2 has some projects. Yes. Oh, okay. I think this will definitely be useful for Rad2. Um, it's it's just a way where it just clearly made no sense to assess all of these things. So it's something. <laughs> um, and when I say previously the slide said reasonably foreseeable. So for deals where they say, you know, yeah, we're converting now, but we're coming back in two years and uh, we're going to recapitalize with financing our tax credit. And that would also be excluded from this peer review. Once they tell you that they're going to do something, you have to take it into consideration. So. Don't ask. Don't ask. <laughs> yeah. But the win is so. The win is important. Two years, we, we're going to do more. Reasonably mushy. foreseeable is the yeah, mushiest the term. Is that when you do that and you, you say, you know, not too much information, <laughs> then you get to loan committee and you're like, why aren't they doing any rehab? Because they're going to do it in two years. Yeah. So, you know. Yeah. And they make you ask the question. I yeah. agree. You, you've been in loan yeah. committee. Yeah. Why, why are they just converting and not doing any, you know, rehab? Because they can. Because they can. <laughs> <laughs> I would like that because. Yeah. Because they can. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Surprisingly, some properties are actually in okay shape yeah. and they're fine. You know, choice deals that close, you know, five, six, exactly. seven years ago. Exactly. There are some that they have actually somehow taken care of these properties. Yeah. Um, so, with the little amount of money that they had. So, I would say reasonably foreseeable is, again, a very mushy term, but if you know that they're going to be doing something, you can't do the tier review, but then it also makes it difficult to encompass those activities in the environment review. So personally, if they're like, yeah, we plan to demolish a building in the future, I wouldn't use the tier review, but I also wouldn't include that in the regular part 50 because I have no idea what's coming down and when it's coming down and how many units and all that stuff. So they're basically, um, they would have to deal with that later within the program PBRA or PBB when they deal with that. And, and when, what ahead. notice did you say that maintenance list? Mm -hmm. CPD 1602. And then I can send that around uh, as well. 
Okay, so I have I, I have a mod rehab that is going to do a recapitalization, they say, in September. And they have this in there. Yeah. You know, so that wouldn't they wouldn't fall under that. No. Uh -huh. Um especially if that's sort of they're contemplating rehab along with that. Um for me and it's at the discretion of the reviewer, but certainly I don't know how it would work if they're, you know, how to oversee the, the rehab once it converts. But as far as the environmental review, it, I would personally feel comfortable talking about rehab within the environmental review that I was doing. But again, it's up to you and it depends. Um, certainly you could say, I'm only going to cover what's happening now, um, but I can't do this tape review because I know. Okay. Yeah. But I, and I also have one that I said, you know, we had a, a light tech transaction with renovations seven years ago. We probably won't be looking to do another one for another seven years. Would that fall under this? I would put that under this because there's no guarantee that they will acquire their tech cards. That they certainly, if they're more they probably will. But <laughs> that's a less defined. It depends on how defined it is. It's a. I would just say work with your branch chief and talk about it, um, you know it when you see it, sort of weird gray areas. Trying to create less gray areas, creating more, but hopefully providing some relief in some of these things. So um, I have one more question. Yeah. So for tiered reviews, if you have some, if you have a project that has scattered types, <laughs> and you have, <laughs> right, 58 of them, yeah. and so you have um, some of them that may fall into the category of maintenance, and some of them that may not. Can yeah. you do a tier review on like just ten? Yeah. And then because you're technically supposed. To, I know scattered sites are another weird area where we've been wavy on like what to include. You're supposed to only really aggregate if they're a certain amount of distance away and just weird things. Um, I've seen some reviews go where we just do it all in one bucket. Um, but you know. You have. Early. I they have to be they're, they're, mm -hmm. Exactly. That's how it's supposed to be, and I think we've gotten better at doing it the, the right way, but it doesn't mean it hadn't happened. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but you're technically supposed to, you're not, you're only supposed to assess if the, it's contiguous or there's those weird measurements. There's like this graphic of like houses and how many feet away they are. Um, basically, it ends up being a lot of environmental reviews. So certainly, because you're doing 58 different environmental reviews, if you can get relief on 10 of them, then cool. <laughs> so um, yeah, it's a way to. I had nine, my, the most I had was 19. And then I had an environmental specialist. I had to call him for something. And he said, well, you could have combined about six of these. And I'm like. <laughs> <laughs> Again, Zika's can be your friend. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes I think, you know, I struggle with this too of like, oh, is this going to create more stuff? But they'll often just be very helpful and give the right answer. Yeah. Like, yeah. Some of yeah. these. Exactly. The, the 58, yeah. And there's, and you may want to talk to Zika too about even pairing within that project. <laughs> Yeah. You asked, and they said no. no. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. That's awful. That seems like a great use of this. Like, you get a bonus after this. <laughs> 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 anyway. Oh, gosh. Yeah. So that's the idea of it, but that's, I'm sorry. Then it, yeah. So at least there's this. Um, so, talking a little bit more about um, what tiered reviews mean here. Um, so there will be standard language for each item that can be assessed in the broad review. I love beating on farmlands because I think it's dumb. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but farmland will have that standard language, um, different things like that. So really what you'll need to care about are these four items. Um, historic preservation, you're just affirming that there's no work upon conversion above maintenance. We will talk a little bit more specifically about this later and how this is operationalized. Um, Coastal Barrier Resource Act, affirm it's in a state without those units or it's not in one of those units. I, um, that's pretty clear. Um, 
flood insurance and floodplain you're still doing is either not in a special flood hazard area or they have proof of insurance or there's an incidental floodplain exemption. And you can even do the five step within this form. So even though there's sort of a higher level of compliance, you can still stay in the tiered review. Um, whereas, yeah. And then for contamination, it's just the regular process doing the phase one or transaction screen. Um, so even if there's like mitigation needed or phase two, you can still stay within the peer review. Um, these can get sort of as uh, intense as needed, um, but the only one that is tricky is historic preservation, which I will talk about in a bit. Um, next slide. So we're still working on the process. This will be a little wonky, um, and guidance will be forthcoming, but uh, it is a little bit manual. Um, in HEROES, there will be sort of one tiered review per branch chief. So there's basically a tier one that talks about this is the tier review for rod conversions, blah, 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 blah. But this is just a way mechanically to get around um, assigning it. So basically, there will be one tiered review, but it'll have to be like assigned to different people. I think we're going to accomplish this in an easier way where sort of one person would upload the tier two forms. Um, by branch. So it, basically, there will be a checklist sort of external to heroes that will be completed that will just need to be uploaded for the tier two. I know that gets back to the stone age of doing things on paper, but it's just, it's, heroes isn't made to really accommodate what we need to do. Um, that will be completed by the PM? Yes, yeah, so the PHA will com complete the first part of the form. Um, basically saying we think we hit all this stuff and then the TM comes behind and affirms it and makes those notes and then it gets signed by the preparer and the approving official um, and then uploaded to heroes. Okay. Again, for the RAD2 world, where there's no PHA, who is going to... Or whoever prepares it. So whoever does the invert, like whatever the entity is that's converting under RAD, the owner. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I figured it was owner, but I wasn't sure. Yeah. <laughs> the owner. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it, we have to work out whether this can work with the 58 programs. Um, I'm not sure that Home and CDBG would be willing to accomplish this. It's unlikely that they would be anyway, because with the inclusion of those funds, it probably means they're doing some sort of work. Um, but I think for PIH PVVs, we can likely get them there because they don't want to do the reviews anyway. So we'll talk, we'll figure that out a little bit more afterward, but hopefully we can get something where everyone's happy. Um, again, this will be a little bit wonky, but we'll, we'll have guidance what's coming on it. Next slide. So for historic preservation, we're supposed to be sending SHPO letters uh, for every action that involves physical changes. This is really dumb. Um, <laughs> and a lot of work. Um, so we've, within the context of this tier review, we've worked with OE and the uh, department's historic preservation officer to create a no potential to cause effects memo. Basically a memo stating that HUD has looked at all these types of activities and I guess I didn't finish that and determined that it can proceed, that we don't have to consult. Basically any activity, maintenance or below, um, we're not consulting with the SHPO. So who issues that no potential to cause effect? Is that HUD? Is that HUD? Mm -hmm. Like what, the, what office? The department. Uh, uh, CPD OE. So, so CPD is determines that. Well, we've worked with them to get the memo created and the legalese and all that stuff that we put in it. But basically, they're the ones who have to issue it. We can't, as a program, say we're not doing this. Okay. And how do we get that? Um, so we, do we go to CTD directly? Once, once, it's, once it's in place, um, they're working on the final revisions now. Once okay. it's in place, we'll send out an email and we'll have a copy of the memo. So okay. even if the tiered reviews aren't established, if those come a little bit later, mm -hmm. you can start using the memo mm -hmm. like the day it comes out. Okay. So, so this is still for maintenance or for in, um, interior? Maintenance and below. Um, so, so not even for upgrades or in, any interior renovations, you still have to send out a I'm nodding solemnly for this. <laughs> <laughs> but it says physical changes. So are you in, is that definition under increasing the density or? It's it, really anything. Really? We're, su we're supposed to be. 
I'm going to plug my ears and you figure out how you actually deal with that. Because but that could be, a, that's a broad definition, mm -hmm. physical well, changes. That's the, so. And those are my words. So yeah. basically, yeah, it's, you're basically, so the way it works is you're determining that. And this is how it often goes for my SHPO letters. I'm saying, I'm doing rehab. It's not really changing anything. SHPO, do you concur? And then there's no response. <laughs> so it's, yeah. <laughs> so they just think it's a waste of their time, too? <laughs> yes, they do. Actually, I've heard that the SHPOs get, like, the. I've heard her in the rumor mill that their most volume for SHPOs is from HUD oh, yeah. because we have no other agencies. Because haven't flushed out this, this policy yes. really well. Yes. And I will talk a little bit more about why that is, but there are other agencies, so like some of the, like something in Medicare with like deals with hospitals and funding for like building or maintaining hospitals, they've drawn a really bright line that says like if it's under 50 years old, we're not consulting and that's it. Which so would they be have a, a memorandum of a, a yes, agreement. agreement. Yeah. Yeah. Or a programmatic agreement or something. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So there are things in place that say like Even single great, family so does too. I mean yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean so I have a hospital that was built forty nine years ago can do some renovations and they don't have to yep. go to ship out. Correct. But housing but 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 Okay, but, and and again, I'm I'm the rad two world mm -hmm. where we're dealing with an apartment building, maybe a mod rehab with nine units that is only renovating the inside of the building. Right, <laughs> would have to go That's to them. Yeah, and we have to go through all of yeah. that. Yeah, it's insane. That needs to be reconsidered <laughs> yeah. by whomever. So this is some relief, and I'll talk more in future slides about maybe getting more bites of the apple. Yeah. But even getting so. here was. Quite difficult. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, I, mean, I mean, I don't know who's on our on our uh, on your on the phone or listening or in the web. But who who has the main opposition coming from for this? Like, clearly, there's nobody that does deals. <coughs> <laughs> it's just somebody that nobody does deals. It's, it's hardly, somebody that does deals. You said that. No, it's oh. nobody that does deals. It's hardly anyone that's in the building. So <laughs> HUD itself is even like this is insane in many cases. So, um, if you go to the next slide, I, maybe I covered in this one. So, okay, no, um, I'll get back to that. If, if let me jump to this, and then I'll talk about what has to happen with HUD in general. Um, so, this memo will apply for 50 or 58. I'm sure 50 uh, responsible entities will be using this liberally because they're probably not doing it anyway. Um, so, it will apply to transactions even outside the tiered review, but it really wouldn't fact pattern really wouldn't fit, but what I said before about once the memo is in place, even if the tiered reviews aren't in place, you can start using that memo. Um, no work that is reasonably foreseeable, about 27% of transactions, and this was the real sticking point, the replacement for reserves. So if they're reserving for window replacement in 10 years, um, what? that's okay. Oh, okay. You can still <laughs> use the memo. This was the biggest thing, mm -hmm. was getting us to be treated like the other programs. So having the RAD PBRA and the RAD PBB turn into a regular PBRA or PBB and how they're treated, which currently they don't do environmental review for the replacement for reserve for PBRA. So why should we? <laughs> so that was the big sticking point. So that's the only, th yes, that is sort of reasonably foreseeable as you can see it, but that's the only sort of thing where you can just, that that's okay. And, and this memo can still be used. The only things we're really talking about reasonably foreseeable are, are they're constructing a new building, they're demolishing something, or they're moving the assistance, or something mm -hmm. like big like that. And you'll know this when you see it. Um, it really does only apply to SHPOs, but the TIPO consultation will likely not be required given the definition of maintenance. And the notice, the notice actually talks about site work, and it's unlikely that you'll have ground disturbance that wouldn't throw it into rehab, but if you have those cases, uh, come talk to me and, and we'll figure something out likely that uh, you'll just consult with the two um, who also will respond. Um, next slide. Um, what this means, you don't have to send those letters, upload the memo into the review uh, record, and more guidance is coming. Um, next slide. Okay, here's why I get to some of the bigger questions. So. 
OAE is pursuing further uh, no potential cause effect action across the department, basically having this make sense for even greater levels of work. So rehab, things that are, you know, not that old, et cetera. So they have to work with the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation. Um, this is where it gets tricky because historically the council has not trusted HUD with their, uh, what they've done in the past. Um, I don't know if you've all seen, but there's, and maybe this is why there's a lot of sort of reviewed uh, fervor around environmental review. You know, HUD really got dinged in the past few years for not complying with our environmental review requirements. Um, so maybe that's born out of that. But basically, um, as for the department in total, they're trying to work with the advisory council to say, like, we want to just draw this right line. Um, I have no idea how long that action will take. Um, who knows? Um, but that's something that I think it's important to recognize that the department is aware and they know it's insane, so they're trying. Um, but they are limited by what they can accomplish. Um, but um, as a solution in the interim, we've talked internally about maybe pursuing programmatic agreements with each of the state historic preservation officers. So working with the preservation officer of D.C., for example, and saying, hey, we have all these, or I'm not going to use D.C. because it's very small, California, <laughs> for example, um, saying, hey, we have all these deals coming down. Here's the volume that we, you know, of all the deals that we may see. This percentage historically has been rehab um, that we don't, that we consult with you, but we think it's kind of silly um, in working through some of those programmatic agreements for those actions above maintenance. Um, that will be worked through. Certainly, if we get 20 of those programmatic agreements, it's helpful. Um, and in those cases, in those states, we wouldn't have to send the SHPO letters. But again, that's not in place, and that's something um, I personally will be working on um, in coming months. Just a way to stop the madness. Because um, I personally don't, um, I think are we, <laughs> hopefully they can make some headway, and if they do, then certainly um, that will be great. But in the meantime, we need to do something. To a little less insane. So, next slide. Okay, um, I'll stop now. Any more questions about the historic <coughs> preservation piece, guidance stuff? Okay. And again, with all these, more information will be coming up. So, uh, back to the slides for the uh, phase ones. Um, <coughs> Just as a quick refresher, you can always reference prior environmental review materials, but you still have to recheck or update items. Um, either the provider does this or, or in cases where you just go get them up yourself, the TAMP completes. Um, occasionally, transactions will have just completed a phase one ESA recently, um, but we've determined that we still will not, we will still not accept a phase one ESA older than one year. Um, so we're really adhering to the MAP guide standards. Um, but we're just drawing a, a clearer line about that. Um, but um, if there is one that's older than one year, it can be updated by a transaction screen. So hopefully that's a more uh, streamlined way for us to get an updated information. Um, so basically the, the summary here is adhering to the same, the ESA can't be older than one year when you start the review. Um, but it, if it is, you can update it with this shorter uh, document. Next slide. Okay, uh, RAD, or sorry, uh, PIH PVVs and RAD Part 50. Um, so instead of evoking 5811C for every single transaction which has P PIH PVVs and there is a RAD Part 50 being done, um, we're going to work with PIH to get a memo in place to document that the 50 will always be accepted by PIH. Um, this sort of means there's no real reduction of work on our end, except that you just wouldn't have to produce that memo. But it would just make clear of like who's doing what and what's happening. Um, normal course of business for us, but it saves time for the transaction. The next slide. What's the, Go what, ahead. what can I get the 5811C uh, memo? So you have to sort of recreate it every time. So I have language that I can send. Can you send it because I'm working on one that has a... Uh, section 18. 
Yeah, so you just do the letter, you send it out, and then upload a copy of the letter to the Red Resource Desk. So there's okay. another Red Resource Desk, I'm sorry, the um, Part 50. Mm -hmm. yep. Just a way to say, hey, we did this, and it's documented here. So this is when a Part 50 is done um, for Part 50. That's also uh, cases where it's done. So you, you would have to do the 5811C. You'll always have to do a memo in those cases because, um, yeah. It's, and it's, it's the same memo? It's just the same. It's, it's, it's a memo, but it's a memo you create, and it's just citing 5811C saying that you're taking this action. Yeah. So, um, so say you have a PBB, just a full RAD PBB conversion but their responsible entity just refuses to do the um, review or they need to close by XYZ and you know it's not going to get done in time, um, but they have all the materials, you can elect to do the 50 using the 5811C memo uh, mechanism. But this is really in those cases where you have maybe uh, you're doing a Part 50 for whatever reason, whether you've elected to do it because of um, the slow responsible energy or lack of capacity or the timing issues or your PBRA. So there may be deals where there's both PBRA and PIH PBBs in where we just do one review and take care of it. So you, we do our one Part 50 <coughs> review for that and upload that letter? So once this guidance is in place, it okay. will just be, you sort of, I'm sure there'll be another standard memo that you would upload, but mm -hmm. basically it's just you're not reinventing the wheel doing another 5811C memo every single transaction. So it's just a standard thing you can throw in HEROES. It says, this is why we're doing this. And so we have the ability to upload the HEROES? <coughs> I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a few places where you can put stuff. Oh, I know, for yeah. each, but I'm saying just like at the oh, end. Oh, in the beginning? Or, no, like when you when you finish all your, your, your review and you get to the end where you're going to send it out for um, certification, is there a place where you can upload like that that memo? It's yeah. actually further in the beginning. Yeah. Oh, it's in the beginning. Yeah, there's okay. a way in like the, I forget which page it is and I'll look and I'll see, but it's like project description. Yeah, I think it is project like that. Project. Yeah. Project. Okay. yeah. Okay. There's like a random yeah. upload button where you can put yeah. stuff. Um. <laughs> I was thinking more as, as a tell you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and just wanted to flag this. Uh, this is something that is current. So this is a not an upcoming guidance change. I should have changed the header, but something that is in place. Just wanted to call your attention to. Um, multifamily has issued new guidance to field staff regarding the treatment of ECM uh, found at sites. Um, currently, the guide states that friable ECM must be abated. Um, that's expensive, but there's now interim guidance and map waiver um, that allows for the possibility of encapsulation. Um, so. Uh, we, I, I'll talk about this later, but I've, I'm working on updating our RAD programmatic environmental review guidance. But in the meantime, this guidance uh, can be used. The FAQ is already on the RAD resource desk. Yeah, and it's, it's a pretty long response. Um, there are like Just different scenarios. Line. Yeah. Do you have it on that one? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's like different scenarios. Um, so some, I think one of the options is you don't even need to encapsulate. Yeah. You can just do the O and M. So this is a big one. Yeah. Um, because there's a lot of asbestos in these places. <laughs> and yeah, and the map guide is currently getting revised again, and this will be in the new map guide when it does come out. So it'll eventually get it'll eventually be formalized into the next map guide. Yeah. So yeah, it's a bridge between the the map guide update. So. Okay. And as I just said, an uh, update, and I'm working on that, incorporating these changes. Talked. I talked about here, um, and making clear that it covers sort of all recap programs where applicable. So right now it says first component RAD transactions. It will be first and second component, for example. Um, there's a lot of jargon and a lot of text in there that's not clear, and just making sure it, it flows a little more smoothly. That being said, that, that guidance is really oriented toward external audiences. Um, so I'll also work on preparing internal guidance. Um, hopefully getting to the point where there's uh, standard language for some of these responses. So for me personally, I have, even though radon is a thing in the in heroes, I have a standard text that I copy and paste in and it says like, Rad doesn't do radon because of XYZ and just 
citing everything that um, is in there. Um, certainly that won't be required, but that's there for you to use if you'd want to. Um, and then more in, uh, internal tips on how to process uh, environmental review. But also don't forget, I think part of that, are we also including like the partner partners doing the yes. part 50 reviews? So yes. I think you had asked, you sort of brought that up, Tanya. So right now, it's not mandatory at this point. There may be a time in the future where it will become mandatory, where um, right now it's voluntary, but the partners, so the the contractors who are doing the part 50, uh, doing the phase ones, mm -hmm. they can actually now get access to HEROES okay. and complete it. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the TM just has to go in, review it, make sure that you agree with everything that they wrote and, and like uploaded, mm -hmm. and then you make your determination. Okay. Um, so, uh, so the registration for that was pretty big up front. It's kind of trickled off recently. Mm -hmm. um, and again, hopefully at some point in the future, we'd be able to make that like a requirement so we free up the time of the TMs. But as you're talking to PHA, it's definitely mentioned that. You know, so it's, it's out there available to their mm -hmm, providers. Mm -hmm. right? And they okay. can get it started before yeah. the financing plan is submitted. So their provider can get everything in there, you know, and then it, it's less work yeah. on our end. So. And so when, where do they access the, they have, they can go straight to the hero? So they have to get, re, uh, they have to get, get registered. registered. Yep. Um, and so if you know people that need to get registered, you can just let, um, uh, myself or Vera knows we're sort of coordinating it, okay. and we can give them the instructions on how to get their cool. registration information. Okay. Yeah, they have to create like a CID or whatever, yeah. or yeah. HI, whatever those things are, um, an H number, but for other people. Um, and then there is a partner cheat sheet which describes, it's not really talking about like what the laws are and how to satisfy them, but just like how to use heroes. Um, I have a final version of that that I can also send around. Um, and I think we can do just one email about the partner mm -hmm. stuff. PHAs are also um, supposed to be started, starting to be allowed to um, enter information as well. Um, and so they can assign them back and forth to each other. So the assign feature in heroes is that, you know, you do that when you have to send it to your branch chief, for example, to uh, approves the review. They can sort of pass it back and forth as they're preparing it and then um, once it's ready, someone will just hold it until the financing plan TM is assigned. If you're the RTM and will be the FTM, they can certainly just send it to you whenever. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, you know, for those cases where there, there may be, you know, some of the enterprise team may be doing the RTM work, the, the consultant or the PHA is just going to hold it until the FTM is so that's an easy way to deal with that. Um, yeah. And just to note too, um, RAD is the only program where they're letting uh, providers enter information to heroes currently. So if they you hear from them, well, I had another deal where I did FHA and they didn't let me do it. Well, because FHA is not letting them do it. <laughs> so mm -hmm. it's, only, it's only for RAD. So um, just in case you get any heartburn from them about why can't they do it for other stuff. Uh, okay, next. Okay, um, and then finally, sort of bigger picture above us, department-wide environmental review is sort of the first area for review under the administration's regulatory reform efforts. Um, it seemed like an easy way to get some uh, wins for them around the, uh, for every regulation you have to remove two, which I personally have no idea how it would be counted and would give me a headache, but um, I think this is right because there are a lot of areas in environmental review where um, things don't make sense, especially between Part 50 and 58, things are handled a bit differently. And for some cases, for some areas, there's a reason that is done, and for some, it's just because they were developed at different times, and it just doesn't make sense. So that's one area where they're cleaning it up. Um, I know they're interested in also doing further categorical exclusions that may not necessarily apply to us because we already sort of have that in place, but who knows? Um, and then maybe further reduction in sort of HUD-only requirements, um, we will see. Um, again, like we implemented next year, but certainly if there's any uh, sort of changes, we'll keep you abreast on that. Uh, but this is definitely, hopefully, something that will help things make a little more sense. Next slide. 
Hey, summary. Um, don't do any of this stuff <laughs> except right now, except for the map weaver on ACM. Um, everything else uh, is coming, uh, but it's not here yet, and we'll certainly let you know when that's in place. Hopefully, we'll have the no potential to cause effects memo uh, first. Hopefully, stuff is pretty like final. It's yeah. Just sort of getting the final write-offs from everybody, but it's pretty far along, so it should be. Yes. Yeah. Shouldn't be too much longer. In the next few weeks yeah. is a reasonable mm -hmm. statement. Um, and I know it's only relief on these subset of transactions, but we'll keep plugging away and, and hopefully get more stuff. Um, okay. Um, I had a break in here, and I think I'm on time, um, but I can just plow through if <laughs> others would like their time back more around the noon time. Um, I'm only going to ask the room. Is that okay? Just keep going. We don't have too much left. Okay. 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 <laughs> and I see no um, electronic hand raising from the crowd on here, so I'll just keep going. Um, okay. Uh, so if we can go to the next slide. Okay. So talking a little bit about some of the roadblocks. Um, I know there are an infinite number of roadblocks we'll run into with this stuff, but just wanted to highlight some some key ones. Um, next slide. So, again, I've referenced these uh, a few times throughout today. Um, there's a lot of online resources to assist. Um, we do have the HUD Exchange, which walks through stuff. There's also something called the Wiser Modules on the HUD Exchange, which are really online training videos if you do need a refresher in some areas. Um, I didn't put it here, but NEPA Assist is just a great uh, quick mapping tool um, to see if there's any sort of compliance issues. Um, but again, don't hesitate to reach out to the field environmental clearance officer. It's literally their job, um, and they have see a lot more of these things than we do. So uh, they'll be able to provide some guidance. And then uh, me, <laughs> if you have any specific programmatic questions or really anything else, uh, don't hesitate. Um, I think it's important that we, you know, I think a lot of times we run into issues and they don't necessarily all coagulate sort of in one place. So if we're seeing sort of systemic problems, it's good to understand that um, and be able to work through some of these things. Um, as a TM, I know Shibos were uh, a really annoying part for me, so that was one of my first personal missions of getting stuff removed. <laughs> so, um, but certainly if there's other things that we need to think about, um, please, please talk to me about it. Um, next slide. Cool. So <laughs> here it's just again highlighting a few common problems. Um, next slide. Um, one of the things we hear a lot is I don't have enough materials to complete the review. And so we talked a bit about this before. The PHA cons our consultant is supposed to produce a complete environmental report, information on all the related laws and authorities, plus the EA factors when there is an environmental assessment done. However, sometimes you may choose to find the information yourself. It is quicker in the back and forth with the PHA, but there is no standard recap practice. So certainly you are within your rights to say this is not complete um, to the PHA. But, you know, that's, that's sort of not this, there's no standard practice for me. Um, next slide. So I tried to break out um, what these, these sort of uh, related laws and authorities into categories of what really is uh, possible to do on your own. Um, there are actually some things where the providers can give you information, but you actually have to deal with the, the um, working through the compliance. So what you must do. Endangered species, um, again, that's, that's only if you have to initiate consultation with fish and wildlife. Hopefully you won't ever have to do that. <laughs> but it, and they certainly can give you information that says, you know, we're only doing rehab, so we don't have to speak to this, or whatever the, the compliance requirements for that are. But as far as if you have to work with fish and wildlife, you would have to, to do that as a TM. Environmental justice is really a purely HUD uh, exercise. Um, there's no way, it's really not appropriate uh, for the consultant and the PHA to opine on that. Certainly they can provide background materials, but that's really just a, a very subjective HUD assessment. Um, and historic preservation, again, HUD initiates consultation with, with the SHPO and the TIPO. Um, they can prepare the materials for you. So for example, each SHPO has 
on their website, they may have requirements or checklists or ways that they want to receive information. Um, certainly the consultant can put that all together, the PHA can put that all together for you. You would just have to be the one to send it and it would be your name on the communication. This is absolutely 110% of the case with uh, TIPOs because, uh, because it's technically sort of a federal to federal uh, exchange, um, it is absolutely important that HUD be the one to uh, initiate consultation with the TIPOs. Um, there are form uh, letters on the HUD exchange, uh, which I link to later, but um, which are standard form letters for TIPOs because they don't vary amongst the different tribes. And again, you only have to do TIPOs uh, letters if there's uh, there's a checklist too that I reference later, but basically if there's ground disturbance, but also if there are tribal entities with claims to the area. So the TDAT tool um, is a way to look that up. So, so here's a list of all the things that you can do. Again, if they don't submit the information for these, you can certainly send it back, but certainly I personally use NEBESIS a lot to just quickly get these maps down because I can do it uh, you know, in a short amount of time, again, you know, hitting on this point is up to you. But air quality for rehab purposes is really easy, um, and all the rest of these, uh, it won't read through them, but basically you can easily get maps that talk to these specific areas. Um, next slide. So there's ones that you can do, but it sucks. <laughs> so it's things that the information is online. It's possible for you to source because they are location-based. Um, actions, but going through the process is really arduous and annoying, so um, I tend to throw those back to the consultant um, or the PHA. Um, so for air quality, new construction, basically when they're increasing densities, you have to go into uh, look at uh, if it will increase a particular matter of certain things. So it just sucks and just make them do it is my advice. <laughs> Um, coastal zone management, I put this here because each state has their own coastal zone management program and it's administered at the state level. So you, you, I often find the information I need by Googling like Georgia coastal zone management and finding the state agency that administers it and then digging around in their website to find the map. Sometimes it may be easier to just ask a consultant to do that because one, they work in that state um, so they already may have the map or know who to deal with. And two, it's just, you want to make sure that you're getting the appropriate information. Um, but certainly it is possible to find it. And then noise. And I put noise here as far as determining um, the distance to noise generators as well as um, if the, uh, um, the DNL calculator online. It's entirely possible to do, but you have to find, like, for the major roadways, you have to find, like, the amount of cars that go by at a speed limit. Uh, it's just insane. Uh, the airport information about how many flights go by, railroad information from the federal FTA, something or other. It's all on HUD exchange. It is possible to do, but it is really onerous. And that's one I really recommend just I'm doing that. throw it back. <laughs> <laughs> right back. It is awful. <laughs> just is not fun. Um, so again. Um, but you can certainly do it if you if you feel up for it. Um, but there are ones where oh, there are ones that they actually must do explosive and flammable facilities. They can only really tell you if uh, those things are on site. You can check um, some state uh, databases for uh, storage tanks and things like that, just to sort of follow up. But there are some things that they just really need to tell you, along with the contamination. So they have to do the phase one. Um, if they don't do a phase one, that's really a poor starting point for the environmental review. Uh, next slide. Nope. Yep. Um, another common problem, uh, PHA is required to do a 58, but I'm not sure if it's done. So again, evidenced by that letter of finding of exempt activity, signed by the responsible entity, which is not the PHA, and um, that completed form 7015.16 issued by the PIH field office. PIH should know this process. However, in practice, I find that they do not. Um, our guidance does have a list of sort of what has to happen. It's a short paragraph in our guidance. Um, I think we talked about taking that out, but it may make sense to keep that as an appendix because it, it, it's just um, 
interesting how much PIT doesn't necessarily know the process. Um, so, but that's really what you're looking for. Um, but you should you should make sure that it the review is for what you're talking about. Um, you don't really look behind, but it can be really clear the review is done for some other purpose. If the project description says like capital fund activities for blah 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 blah, and, and it may make sense for that to be used, but again, they may have to reconsult with their responsible entity. Um, this is one that happens a whole lot. Um, you did the 58, but there's in a special flood hazard area or floodway. Um, good luck. <laughs> um, you can check to see what the situation is. Um, an easy way is to go to the FEMA mapper website and just see what it looks like. Um, the buildings can't be in a floodway. That's just supposed to be standard practice. Um, it may be the case that these buildings were built before it was mapped to have a floodway. It's certainly the case for very old public housing properties. Um, but they literally can't put people in places where flood water is supposed to go. Um, so Section 18 may be the answer for them. Um, I know we've had a few which they get all the way through and we are reviewing uh, per our approval memo checklist where we have to check if the flood insurance is required and you may double check and just see that, oh, they actually do need flood insurance because there is a floodway on site. So or even or, worse during closing. Or during closing. When they're doing title review and they find it. So. Yeah. So although we don't look behind on 58, I think this is one, because it is in our memo, I certainly personally feel uh, free to check the FEMA flood maps and just make sure, because we do see this so much. Um, again, just talk to your branch chief and then talk to the PIH field office. Um, just make sure everyone's aware of, of what these, what's going on. Um, so just a few quick heroes use tips and just some other general tips that I didn't know where to put, so I put them at the end. <laughs> Next slide. Um, you've all, for those of you who worked with heroes a lot, you know it can time out, so just make sure you're saving frequently. Um, if you're working on a long narrative, just put it into Word first. Um, if you're copying and pasting from the phase one, for example, there may be some weird spacing and special characters. You can take those out. Uh, Word auto saves, but heroes times out. So. I, the advice that I would have for everyone. Um, one thing is just to make sure that the review is archived after the approving official certifies. And I put a little graphic of like the little menu on the left in Heroes. Um, you, the certifications are where everyone certifies that, yep, this is cool, and the review is done. There's the complete archive page where it's just a button that says archive that you push, and that's it. Um, and there's also an area for the mitigation follow-up, which is specific to each deal. Um, just a note quick on the mitigation. For me, I've, you know, I think this happens a lot where there's like asbestos O&M plans or, or levies and O&M plans that are required and they may get you those pretty quickly, um, if, you know, and the review is not yet completed, you can just throw those in and sort of make it part of the review itself um, if you don't want to deal with the sort of mitigation piece. Um, general tips. Uh, FICO is there to help. Uh, emphasize this a uh, few places. Um, they may ask to review, uh, but we do want the signature. It's not required, um, but I, it's good practice and, and a FICO declining to endorse a review is a bad thing, even if it's not a requirement. So uh, just make sure, um, you know, we, we get them what they need. Um, some of them are a little bit pickier than others, I will be honest. You know, I've had ones that say, oh, you have to really uh, upload the ESA every single place or different things of how they particularly request to do things. Um, it's just better to get it done. So that's all I'll say about that. But generally, they're a wealth of information and very helpful. Um, make sure your maps have the site marked. Um, that's a pretty easy one. Um, when referencing the Phase 1 ESA, it's helpful to provide sort of the report numbers, the dates, page numbers, things like that. Um, this is especially true if it goes to the FICO. Um, I've had ones where pretty much every time they've come back and said, you really need to cite the exact report. So it just tends to be good practice. Um, personally, I have like a, if they do give me one report with everything in it, um, 
I have I copy and paste the text is like per ABC consulting report number is 300 dated May 9th uh, page number whatever it is there is a map that says blah 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 there is text that says blah 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 so so and that's in lieu of because what I do is for each uh, related laws and authority I upload the, yep. the, the report itself yep. the, the map. that works too yep okay yep it's just preference, yeah, um, okay. but if, if, yeah, yeah, it just really um, right. helps make it clear. This is more important, I think, too, when it goes to Chico and they're a little pickier and they like it to be very nice, teeth crossed type thing. Uh, snipping tool is your friend. <laughs> it's great, um, easy way to take pictures of stuff. Uh, that are not PDFable. I know I personally have problems sometimes with uh, the FEMA for maps. Um, getting in, um, you actually have to print it as a PDF to upload it into Heroes. Um, but I'll often put like a, if and, if and if it's not clear on the firm itself where the site is, I'll often have a second map which shows the site. So, um, and then I also, uh, I, that's the wrong site, <laughs> but cite the website and the date taken uh, just in the comments. Um, I talked about this before, but shipper letters are not standard, tipper letters are standard, and then the uh, the two -out checklist, just in case others haven't seen it. Um, and next, and that is actually it. Um, I talked a lot faster, and I should know this about myself <laughs> than I had anticipated. But uh, you all get, uh, you know, some more time back on your day. I uh, just want to make sure anyone uh, doesn't have any questions in the room um, on the computer slash phone. Um, please email me if you have any questions or comments, again, um, once the guidance is in place on those changes, um, we will communicate that to you, but just wanted to give you a heads up so you don't get it all at once and have to, to decipher and sort through it. Um, plus, I wanted to give the good news, <laughs> even if it's tiny good news, um, just a way to do that. So, um, there's no more questions. Um, we are all set, and everyone's ready to go. Thank you. Thank you. Cool. Yeah. Thanks for coming, those in the room. And thanks for hanging out on the phone. <laughs> cool.